Well, I think we'll get things started this evening. Um, thank you very much for coming today to the last lecture of the spring 2011 term in the Dalhousie University Schulich School of Law public lecture series. It's great to see so many people excited and interested about copyright law. Um, my name is Graham Reynolds. I'm an assistant prof here at the law school, and I teach and research in the areas of copyright law, intellectual property law, and property law. So today what I'm going to do is just give an introduction generally to copyright law. Um, until recently, copyright was an area of the law that was only of interest to a very narrow subset of lawyers, lobbyists, and academics. Uh, increasingly, however, many individuals are seeing how copyright impacts our lives on a daily or near daily basis, and how copyright laws can help shape tomorrow's technologies and tomorrow's culture. So again, today I'll give an intro to copyright law, I'll outline some copyright basics, and we'll discuss several copyright myths. So a few of the issues that I'll focus on will be, you know, what is copyright? Why, uh, in my opinion, does copyright matter? Um, are there any defenses to copyright infringement? Uh, do I have a right to copy for personal use? What are digital locks and how do they relate to copyright? Uh, what was proposed in Bill C-32, the latest attempt to amend Canada's copyright law? Uh, and what impact would this have had on the rights of copyright owners, users, Canadian culture and freedom of expression more generally. So I'm planning on speaking until around 7 or so uh, and then taking questions. But having said this, if you have any questions over the course of the next hour, please feel free to ask at any point. Um, I'll also ask sort of at several points during the next hour for, uh, for your input on certain questions. Hopefully this can be an interactive experience as well as, uh, as, well as just sort of me imparting some information. Now, one disclaimer before I start, um, nothing that I say here today should be interpreted as legal advice. Um, if you do have specific questions on particular copyright issues, um, I recommend discussing those with a lawyer. Um, what I want to do today is just basically give information on copyright and have a broad discussion on copyright issues and myths. So first, copyright basics. Um, in Canada, as well as in many countries around the world, laws have been passed that grant creators a bundle of rights in the works that they create. And this bundle of rights is called copyright. So copyright, or the idea that one can own exclusive rights in expression, is a relatively recent creation. And in fact, it emerged with the development of one specific technology. Any idea of what that technology might have been? Great, right, the printing press. Uh, so the, before the printing press came along, it was quite hard and time consuming to make multiple copies of books. And the way the books were produced had a direct impact on the way the books could be sold. So essentially on commission. A uh, customer would go to a printer, referred then as, to a, as a stationer, and would order a book. <clears throat> the stationer would then create this book according to the customer's tastes and preferences. The printing press, though, made it easier to print multiple copies of books. And this had the result of changing the business models of many publishers. So publishers or stationers then created multiple copies of books which were sold throughout time, as opposed to creating one book sold to a particular customer. Now one problem with this new system was that publishers could print the same book, multiple copies of the same book, and then undercut each other in terms of price. So pressure then began to build for the development of some sort of system to regulate the business of book publishing. And essentially book publishers wanted an artificial monopoly. They wanted a guarantee that they would be the only party to, uh, who would be entitled to print a specific work. And only in that case would they be, be sure that, they could, that the investment they put into printing the book could be recouped uh, from the sale of the book later on. Now initially publishers petitioned governments for these monopolies and petitioned successfully in many cases. And later they made an agreement amongst themselves in the context of a group of publishers or stationers called the Stationers Company. So they agreed that no other member of the stationers company, which was composed largely of members, uh, publishers in the London area, could publish the same title. But this system had limitations. Uh, can anyone think of what limitations this system might have had? It only applies to closed groups. Right, exactly. So it only applies to this closed group. The agreement was only valid between members of the stationers company. So people who weren't members of this company weren't prevented by, their, by the internal rules of the company from publishing works. And the actions of these so-called rogue publishers, rogue from the perspective of the stationer's company, uh, including many publishers from Scotland, uh, frustrated the stationer's company and led to calls for additional public protection 
for the publishing industry. And some of these early calls were rejected. But they were later granted, uh, uh, they were later sort of uh, heard by the government of England after the government recognized that the stationer's company could help enforce its censorship laws that it brought in due to religious tension in the 1530s. Now after a period of time, due to various reasons, including the high prices of books, concerns about the supply of books, and the lapse of this censorship legislation, the early control held by the stationer's company was broken. But pressure for continued protection led to what we see as the first copyright act that was not connected to censorship, which was called, uh, in, in its long form, uh, an act for the encouragement of learning by vesting the copies of printed books in the authors or purchasers of such copies during the times therein mentioned. And for the rest of the talk, I'll refer to this as the Statute of Anne. Uh, and the statute was enacted in 1709 and came into force in 1710. So that's a little bit of a history of copyright in a nutshell. But it's quite relevant today because we can trace Canada's Copyright Act directly back to the Statute of Anne. And some of the pressures that were involved in terms of you know, how the Act came about are still present today. So now that we've got a bit of history, let's look at what Canadian copyright law actually looks like. Um, before we do so, though, any questions or comments up to this point? What was the applicability beyond England of this statute? <clears throat> well, we see in many other countries, it, it wasn't applicable beyond, beyond England. So it was only applicable in, in, in England itself or in the, in the UK. Um, but many other countries had early struggles as well in terms of how to deal with publishing, how to ensure the development of a local publishing industry. Um, you know, many other countries had censorship concerns as well. So we see um, similar types of developments occurring in, in other countries, uh, differing you know, greatly depending on context, but a roughly similar sort of halting development of the, this, the walk towards copyright legislation. Um, actually, that's one good point that I should mention. So copyright legislation is essentially national. So countries originally, before there were international treaties, could do whatever they wanted with respect to copyright. So you had some countries that um, generally had a strong publishing industry, would have strong copyright laws. Other countries that didn't have initially a strong copyright industry would have weak copyright laws, at least with respect to um, you know, foreign individuals and, and their books, so as to build up that local, the local publishing industry. The United States is a good example of this type of country. We're very early on, um, the, the copyright protection for you know, books from the UK, for instance, was, uh, was weak to non-existent. Um, and then later when local, uh, when the United States uh, publishing industry developed, those um, laws became stronger. But what we see today though is, although countries are still able to you know, create their own copyright laws, this is occurring in, an, in a web of international treaties. So the, countries are constrained in terms of what they can do. So we can pass copyright laws, but they have to comply with certain treaties that we've also, we've also agreed to. So copyright is, is national. It applies just in the country to which it's, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that has passed that legislation, but it occurs in an international web. Okay, so let's look at Canadian copyright law today. Um, now, copyright's said to be a creature of statute. So that is to say, aside from a few issues, the rights and responsibilities of copyright users, owners, and other parties are set out exhaustively in the Copyright Act. So if you want to know what Canada's copyright laws are, the best place to go to is initially the Copyright Act and then to look to you know, what are the cases that have interpreted those provisions. So I said earlier, copyright is a bundle of rights owned by the copyright owner in a certain work. Does anyone have any suggestions of what some of these rights might be or what some of these sticks might be in this bundle? It, well, let's say uh, if we look at profits in the sense of the right to make a copy and then sell that copy, the right to reproduce a work is definitely one stick in the bundle of rights. But it certainly isn't the only rights that copyright owners have. They also have the right to perform the work in public, the right to communicate the work to the public by telecommunication, the right to publish any translation of the work, the right to convert a dramatic work into a novel or other non-dramatic uh, non work, the right to convert an artistic work into a performance in public, and the list just goes on. So in terms of this bundle of rights, we can imagine there are many sticks in this bundle of property rights that the copyright owner acquires. So in terms of 
if I can ask you to play the role of a judge for one minute, um, how would you interpret the right to reproduce a work or a substantial part of a work? What do you think this right should include? Or when, when should we say that someone has infringed the right to reproduce a work or a substantial part? When they're not the owner. Okay. Great, so in, in those instances where someone's not the owner and they, they reproduce a portion of the work, then we can say they've, they've, rep uh, they've reproduced a substantial part of a, part of a work. Well, in terms of how substantial is defined, that could be another question. You know, what do you think substantial might mean? Or if you were a judge, how would you define substantial? If we had, let's say, a 300-page book, how would you determine what a substantial taking from that book might be for the purpose of copyright infringement? OK, great. We can look at how much of the work is taken. Should we look at anything else as well? Whether the items can stand alone by itself. OK. Sure, yeah. So one thing we can look at was, you know, uh, could the book stand on its own if that amount was taken? Or would the amount that was taken, is that, you know, uh, I think what you might be getting is, is it sufficiently important to the book itself? And that's really the, the two-pronged test the courts will look at when they're looking at substantial. How much of the work was taken? And how important was the part that, was, that was, was taken? How important is that to the work that was allegedly infringed? So one example, if we look at a song, for instance, um, you, if you take the hook from a song, so sometimes three or four bars, it's the core of the song. Some have said that it's the, you know, the most profitable ele uh, element of a pop song, for instance. It can be very short in a three-minute song. could be 12 seconds, for instance. If someone takes that and reproduces that in a different work, that's enough to be a substantial taking um, uh, on the, uh, you know, through the interpretation of Canada's copyright laws. Now, in the U.S., one case has said that if you take a single note, that's enough to constitute uh, a reproduction of the work. We haven't gone to that part yet. Uh, based on some analysis that I've done in Canadian case law, it looks like if you can recognize the song in a new song, that would be seen as a substantial part. Okay, so the right to reproduce a work it's infringed if you reproduce the entire work or a substantial part of the work, which is defined by looking at the quality of the, uh, the, quality of the taking or how important it was or the quantity or how much you took. What about the right to perform the work in public? Again, play the role of a judge. How do you think that this right should be defined? So when should someone be seen as performing a work in public? How about one example? Uh, let's say it's a charity event that doesn't charge admission and that doesn't admit the general public. Should this be seen as a performance in public? Depends. I mean, how large the group is. Okay. Whether you know the individuals or not. Um, I think there's a knowledge uh, aspect there. The owner can choose to pass it on. Okay, so if we look at, you know, how, how big was the group? How many people were there? We could define public in that way. So public is 10 or more, private is under 10. That's certainly one way that judges could like it, look at it. One way could be, well, public is anything out in the open. So if it's open, without concealment to the knowledge of all, we could see that that potentially being public, which would mean that any closed door performance could potentially not be a public performance. One way that courts have looked at it is, um, you know, we need to look at the audience. And if the audience could be said as being part of the copyright owner's public, so someone who would be interested in paying for that sort of event had they not gone and received, uh, and with the you know, copyright owner not receiving compensation, then that will be seen as a performance in public. One thing that wouldn't be seen or that hasn't been seen in the past as being a performance in public has been just a general, you know, a, a play breaks out at a house, for instance, uh, or a small house party, or you know, children putting on a play for, for a family. Um, Courts have, have said that this, this isn't public. So in terms of what actually is public, we don't know definitively. What we do know is that a small you know, house party where it's, you know, a play is ancillary or something just breaks out, um, that wouldn't be seen as public. But beyond that, courts have you know, struggled with these issues. And one of the reasons they've struggled with it is because the idea that you know, we should reward copyright owners 
for the work that they've put into either creating, if they're the actual creator or author, or the, the risk they're taking in distributing the work. And we want to create that reward, and if we don't have that reward or that incentive, then people won't create works in the future. <clears throat> but I think that there's, there's a definitely a tension as you go in, in terms of you know, what's the, um, what should individuals be able to do without having to compensate a copyright owner, and, what should, and in what circumstances should the copyright owner have to be compensated. So we've looked through two of the rights. Now the right to communicate the work to the public by telecommunication, we can see that as being you know, pushing content out through a television, pushing content out over a, over a radio, but the internet brings another issue as well. So the internet is also seen as a situation where you can communicate a work to the public by telecommunication. But one issue there could be, you know, what are the steps that are required? When are you actually communicating a work to the public by telecommunication online? You know, do you think it's when you initially upload the work? Or does something else actually have to happen as well? And what courts have found in this instance is that you know, the act of making available a work online uh, or the act of, of you know, uh, uploading content to the internet is only half of the action for communicating a work to the public by telecommunication. The other half is when somebody pulls that content. So if you upload something, that's, you know, you're on the way to communicating to the public by telecommunication, but you're not fully there yet and the right's not infringed until someone else pulls that content down. But as we've seen so far, you know, there's definitely disagreement about what, you know, how broadly or narrowly should these rights be interpreted, or how much power should we give to copyright owners, how much ability should we give to, uh, to individuals or to users to use works or to engage with content without having to compensate someone. Now in terms of what copyright infringement is, in section 27 of the Copyright Act, um, this section says essentially that just, you know, anytime anyone does, any of the things with your expression, without your permission, that you have the exclusive right to do, that they're infringing your copyright. So the bundle of rights that we've seen before, anytime anyone does anything that you have the right to do without your permission, on the face of it, they're infringing your copyright. Any other questions up to this point? Or, or taking a chance of public. That, right. That, that implies a capitalist business kind of model. Yeah. Right? That, that's what you're making money specifically. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And one, of the, one that we'll talk about, sort of one of the copyright basics, is that you know, the, the, the author of a work is the, you know, is the first owner of the copyright in all but a few circumstances. If the author is creating the work in the course of employment, and as an employee, then the employer gets the copyright. But generally, you know, if I just sit at home and I, you know, I write a novel, I'll be the person who owns the first, who owns the first copyright. But copyright can be assigned. So if I want, then I can assign my copyright to a publisher, which I might be required to do if I'm trying to publish a work. If I write a song, I might have to assign it to, to a label if I want to get my record, my record produced. In order to make that assignment valid, it has to be in writing and it has to be signed. Um, but certainly there's a recognition that, you know, uh, although author is the, an author is the first owner of copyright, they're, they're not necessarily the only individual who, the, or the individual who can profit from, uh, who, who, can, who has the necessary capital to be able to, um, to bring that work to the public. Um, so, and it's interesting as well, if we look back to the Statute of Anne in 1709, it's called, you know, it, it's, you know, authors are in the title, but publishers are behind the author. So it, it, one of the, you know, a large section of the commentary about the Statute of Anne is that we see, you know, publishers trying to continue to protect their, um, their interests and their rights, but they're doing so by holding out the author. That This is really about the author's interest. And certainly there were authors as well who were quite concerned about, you know, being able to have some say and some ability to, um, uh, to, um, to profit from and to control those rights. But in a lot of instances, again, it's, 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 it is tied into um, you know, just as it was before the Copyright Act came into play, the interests of, of publishers and those who, um, who can provide the capital investment to move things forward. Yep? Uh, in terms of authoring something, do you have to assert your copyright ownership to it? Like, if I just write something on a piece of paper, yeah. is, is copyright implied just because I've written it and it's on a piece of paper? Well, we'll look in a minute or so in terms of whether, you know, what, what a literary work is and whether just writing anything down constitutes literary work. 
But in terms of registration requirement, you don't have to do anything to register your copyright. So the second that you take your pen from paper, the second that you finish, you know, you save something on a computer screen, for instance, you have copyright in that work. Now, it used to be the case in the US that you actually did have to go through a process of registration in order to get copyright. It was sort of a necessary step in order to, uh, to have this bundle of rights. But uh, not so anymore in the US and definitely not so in, in Canada. Um, you don't have to do anything aside from, from, finish, uh, you know, from you know, taking your pen away from paper to have copyright in the work, provided those other criteria are satisfied. Yep? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, this is kind of an intriguing area. Yeah. Because there are uploaders and then there are downloaders. Yes, yeah. So you just mentioned the uploaders. Right. And what about the downloaders? Well, I'll open it up to the group. So someone who downloads a work from the internet, we won't talk about defenses, but uh, just on what we've talked about so far, are there any rights that you can see that might have been infringed in downloading something from the internet? Well, I think, I think you know, the act of, if we connect the act of downloading to making a copy, so if by downloading something you're making a copy onto your computer, the copyright owner has the exclusive right to reproduce the work. In downloading something, you're making a copy, you're reproducing the work, so you're uh, on the face of it infringing the copyright owner's rights. We'll look at some defenses in terms of whether you might have a defense to, to that act of downloading a work. But um, in the context of the internet, then the act of a user or someone pulling the content down or downloading it would both complete the act of infringing the right to communicate the work to the public by telecommunication and also be a separate, um, you know, unless there's a defense, separate act of infringement of reproducing the work itself. But how is that any different than finding a book? Can you take it as your own copy? No, that's a great question. Well, when you, when you find a book and you take it home, you're not making a copy of it at all. So no extra copy is being created. Probably the best example I can say is, is uh, for a collage situation. If you, um, if you make a collage out of, you know, it takes six or seven, let's say, you know, books, pieces of art, uh, anything else, you cut, you know, cut pieces out, put them onto a collage, you have a new collage. But nothing was reproduced. You took one copy initially, and you end up with one copy. If you do it in an online context, you cut and paste something, and you start with that one digital copy, and you end with the second copy. And that's one of the reasons why the internet has had such a, why copyright is now such an important issue because of the internet. Because essentially with everything you're doing, you are making a copy. You're making a, a temporary copy or a, um, a, a very, very brief copy. But as a result, that's allowing copyright law to, to sort of to, um, to get a grip on that situation. Whereas other actions, sharing a book, giving a book to a friend, um, making a collage out of something, taking a book out of the library, um, tearing something out of a newspaper, and passing it along to someone else. You're, you're not making a copy in, in, in any of those activities. So it's the, the act itself of just creating that temporary copy that would in, allow copyright law to become involved. And so if you use it online rather than download it, then, then what, what do you do with that? Well, the question is just then, you know, ha has a reproduction been made? And if it has, then copyright law can get, can get involved. So if it has, in terms of like a streaming activity, um, then uh, those cases are starting to come before the courts. Um, but the question there will be, you know, who, who's committing an infringing act and which party, can, which party can potentially be sued? Is it the internet service provider that's allowing that um, fee to come through? Is it the person who, who initiates it? Is it the person who receives it? So it's, it's, it's an interesting area. I saw a few more hands up. Yep. What about the creation of derivative works? What constitutes a derivative work, like a parody or yeah. example? Yeah. No, that's a great question. The, the, the idea of a derivative work um, is you, know, you take something and you make something, and you make something new. The only thing we'll look at in copyright law generally is, did you take a substantial part of a work and use it to make a new work? And if in that new work there's still a substantial part of the original work, then you've on the face of it infringed copyright. So if you take, um, if you want to make a Mickey Mouse parody, for instance, and you take Mickey Mouse and you put him in a different situation, the question is just not did you create a new work or did you, does your work have social value or is your work important or is it, is it, is it critical? Those will definitely come to play in terms of our, our analysis of defenses to copyright infringement. But initially in terms of just was a, was a right infringed, it's did you take a substantial part of the work? 
If so, you reproduce the work, and on the face of it, you can be held liable for copyright infringement. Yep? Yeah. Yeah, I think it even goes beyond implied consent. I think they're just giving you a license. So again, you're you're infringing copyright when you when you do one of the things that are in the bundle of sticks of the copyright owner without their authorization. But you know, if they're putting up songs on their websites and inviting downloads, then certainly it's uh, you know they're giving you a license to make a copy of that work, likely for the limited purpose of just being able to download it and then listen to it later. Um, but I think that, you know, and that license might be there as well with works that you find on peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services, but it's much more difficult to actually find out, so there is that risk of being, um, being held liable for copyright infringement. Mm -hmm. I understand why we're interested in protecting the creators of work. Yep. Why are we interested in protecting infringers? Why are we interested? Um, like what, what work is there that uh, is in the public interest? Good question. Um, I think that um, publishers definitely serve a role with respect to the public interest in that uh, if it weren't for publishers, um, a lot of works would not be disseminated as broadly as they are right now. So I think in terms of, you know, are, do publishers have too, too many rights? Do corporate owners have too many rights? Is certainly a, a question that can be debated. Um, but in terms of, you know, publishers serving a vital role of taking content and disseminating it to a larger, to a larger group than would otherwise be able to access that book, there's a public interest and there's a freedom of expression value, value in that. Certainly the internet has, has, um, has posed a challenge to a lot of traditional publishers in terms of their, their business models. Being able to, uh, if, if content can be disseminated by creators to, a, to a, a wide range of people without having to rely on an intermediary, um, then that, that might be something that changes business models in the future. But I think in terms of the ability to disseminate content to a wider group, is, uh, there's significant value in that. Doesn't have to do with fixed costs. So if we think of a movie production, usually the distributor and the producer are interwoven very closely. But in the case of, say, a book, mm -hmm. we have an author here. Now let's ignore the fact that there are payments to the author. Yep. If it was possible to pay the author directly, why do we care? You know, the book publisher has produced a hundred copies or a thousand copies or whatever. He sells them. Why do we care if there's any more published by somebody? In terms of, you know, why do we care if a second publisher publishes the same, the same books? I think the question is then, would that first publisher have actually published those books if they didn't have the guarantee that they'd be the one person who could publish it? If they knew that someone could publish, a, um, publish an edition of that book for a third of the price, uh, that people would only buy that, that, that second cheaper edition, and the investment that they put into the first, to the first set of books, you know, would, uh, would be lost. The question could be... Why don't they, let's say we like photocopy books because they're cheap. Why, why doesn't the publisher A, realizing that there's a market for cheap books, make photocopy copies available? And you, we'd have a choice. We could buy the five cents a page one, mm -hmm. or we could buy the hardbound copy. You know, there are options now. But yeah. I'm not, I'm not, you know, like, uh, if there's a market and it's not being served, why can't somebody else serve? Yeah, and I think these questions are all legitimate ones in terms of questioning why do we need to have these property rights. And they're questions that have been raised really ever since the 1700s and even before with the Stationers Company. You know, why do we need to have this protected wall around, around expression? Um, you know, certainly we see cer you know, certain types of price discrimination right now in terms of you know, an edition comes out first in a hard cover, people wait for a while, then it comes out in a soft cover. So we see certain limited types of price discrimination, not to the point of publishers putting, you know, putting out photocopy copies of, of books, but certainly I think you know, uh, that's something that we might see a little bit later. But these are all questions that, that really do and really have been asked for hundreds of years. What role do, do intermediaries play? And why should, why should we be giving intermediaries exclusive rights in content, which means essentially that, that other individuals can't, uh, you know, can't do anything that would fall within the scope of those rights. There's a few more copyright basics that I want to go through as we're, as we're moving on. Um, first one, you can't have copyright in facts or information. Um, so if, if it's just a fact or a piece of information, it's not protectable by copyright. 
but you can get copyright in the way that you arrange or express that fact or that information. Um, now, in terms of whether copyright should be extended to cover facts or information, certain jurisdictions have taken that step. Uh, Australia, for instance, um, you know, information can be protected by, by copyright itself. But I think there are some potential freedom of expression issues. <coughs> On the flip side, though, you know, people do work hard to discover facts or to create information. So we might want to, to reward or encourage that creation. And also information is socially valuable. I think that can go to both sides. If it's socially valuable, we should allow everyone to use it. If it's socially valuable, we should try to encourage its creation. So some of these same debates are going on. Uh, as well, you can't have copyright in ideas. So the idea of making a painting of a hockey player who's skating down Spring Garden Road, no copyright in that idea. Anyone in the room can go make the same painting, should you wish. Um, but if I actually make that painting, and then someone copies that exact, that, that exact same expression, then, uh, then I can have copyright or can have property rights in my version of that idea. Now, there are also a few criteria that do have to be satisfied before you can be granted a property right in your expression. The first is a residency requirement, which is um, quite easy to establish. Um, so I mentioned before that copyright is national. So you know, Canada has copyright laws. The US has copyright laws. You know, countries around the world will have them. Uh, and generally, you know, it used to be the case that you could do whatever you want. You could uh, you know, develop your copyright laws as you wished. But you know, now we have international treaties that impose minimum standards of protection. So our laws are restrained in terms of what we actually can do. So essentially, for this residency requirement, you just have to have, um, you know, when you made the work, be a citizen or subject of or a person ordinarily resident in a treaty country, which is defined in any country uh, that's a member of the Berne Convention of the Universal Copyright Convention or the World Trade Organization. So this, the second that anyone creates a work in any of those countries, protection springs up in Canada. The second requirement is your expression has to be fixed. So you can imagine paint has to be on canvas, you have to be typing on a computer uh, once you save, for instance, or writing on paper. So this isn't a criteria that's required by the Copyright Act, instead it's one that has been imposed by judges. So do you think that this criteria, that a work has to be fixed in order to receive copyright protection, is a good idea? Does this mean your lecture is not copyright? Well, the, actually, it's interesting with lectures. So if, you, uh, if anyone who's sort of speaking off the cuff and someone who takes notes based on that, the person who, uh, who, who, takes those, who takes the notes, who writes it down, that's the person who has copyright protection. Um, my lecture is, is quite tightly scripted. Uh, so, based on that, you, I could argue that if anybody copied it down, it would be a reproduction based on the notes that I have. So, if the, the, closer, that one, the closer that one stays to one's detailed notes, uh, you know, I, I, I would have copyright protection in what I'm doing. But if someone who's, who's, you know, speaks off the cuff in that situation, anybody who writes it down has copyright in that. We see that emerge in um, a lot of cases involving politicians and new, uh, journalists who, who take down the speeches of politicians. That those journalists who take that down actually are the ones who, who have copyright in those speeches. Yep? Even if you sold tickets to it as a performance, like an improv night? Improv is quite interesting, because improv is something that I think is not fixed as well. And that's, that's one of the issues, I think, with the fixation requirement. Where, is, I mean, one of the reasons why the fixation requirement is, is in place, I think, is that it's really important when you go before a court and allege that someone has infringed your copyright when, you know, when, when, when you're asked, okay, well, what, you know, in what was, your, you know, what was your copyright infringed, to be able to say, okay, well, here's, here's the book, and you can compare it. With the work that's not fixed, it can be much more difficult to actually, to actually do that. Um, so for an improv night, if, you can, uh, if, uh, if, the, if the evening is filmed, for instance, and someone reproduces a copy of, of the work, you can argue at that point that there was some sort of reproduction of a fixed work. Um, another... Um, But likely the videographer would be an employee um, who, you know, and they would be creating the work in the course of employment or a contract could be signed where they, they waive any rights to copyright or copyright goes to, the, goes to the group itself. So there are ways to engage with those issues and to ensure that you can try to keep that copyright within your, within your group. But one famous Australian example is uh, a moving sand sculptor um, had the, their work, their work um, you know, someone else essentially created the same moving sand sculpture. Uh, or one that was substantially similar, but there was no recourse in copyright law because the work wasn't fixed in itself. 
So I think there's, it's an issue in terms of whether this fixation requirement should be there or whether it's just something um, that should be you know, a good idea when you're going before a court. <coughs> the other requirement is that, or one of the requirements, is that the work actually has to be original. So how do you think that we should define original? So in order to be protected by copyright, a work has to be original. What do you think that should mean? Okay, so, so it's, a, it's a new work. It's not, it hasn't been created before. It has this element of novelty. Any other suggestions? Okay, so some sort of connection to, uh, um, to the individual or to, or to authenticity itself. Now, the approach the UK has taken is that it's, it's referred to as the sweat of the brow approach. So which is essentially, you know, if it originates from the author, if it's more than a mere copy, and that's enough to satisfy this originality requirement. In the US, they want to impose some sort of creativity standard to you know, what originality means. But they don't want to make the standard too high to make it too difficult to acquire copyright. So what the standard has said in the US is that you have to have a spark or a modicum of creativity. In terms of what that means, it, yeah, it, it's, yeah, exactly. So what does it mean to have a spark of creativity? Well, it's something. There's some, it's, it's you know, more than a phone book, which is the case that established that. Um, but how much more it'll be a case-by-case -case determination. In Canada, again, it's slightly different. It's uh, potentially between these two standards. But it's said as you know, it's original if it originates from the author, if it's more than a mere copy, and if it's the product of an exercise of skill and judgment that's more than mechanical. In terms of what this means, well, we have it applied in, in, in one case, and that's the case where this, uh, this statement came out of. If you create head notes based on a court decision, so you summarize the, summarize the decision in a paragraph or so, um, that will be seen as original. That's an exercise of skill and judgment. That's more than mechanical. Something if you just change the font, if you add page numbers, again, the court said, well, that's not original. That's not an exercise of skill and judgment. That's more than mechanical. So you have to satisfy this originality requirement, which may not be a very high threshold. You also have to establish that your work is a literary, artistic, dramatic, or musical work. And we also have rights like you know, sound recording rights, but I think I'll just focus on those types of works for now. So one question I want to ask, how should courts define a literary work? So if you, if, in order to be protected, if it's sort of in a literary context, your work is original, its uh, residency requirement is satisfied. What should we, what should we uh, say is a definition of a literary work? Any suggestions? Should we just high culture? So just a novel or should we impose a length requirement? Length is something that would be okay. more than a sentence. Okay. I don't think you can copyright it. Well, maybe you can, but Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So length, length should have something to do with it. So we'll, we'll, we'll bring the length requirement along. Any other suggestions? Genre. Genre, okay. So for literary work, you have, we should have some sort of determination of, of you know, this aesthetic requirement, what, uh, what genre it might be. Did anyone write a grocery list today? Well, you have copyright in that grocery list because the literary work, the way the courts have defined it is it's just anything that's expressed in printer writing. The courts have decided that that should be the appropriate definition for literary work. Now, there are pros and cons to this determination. The pros are judges don't have to engage in the question of what is literary, of what has aesthetic value. The con is that that make, means that most things that are actually written down are subject to copyright protection for the entire term of protection and for all of the bundle of rights. So if someone performs your grocery list in public, you have a potential claim. <laughs> Yes, yeah, software is definitely included, yeah. So it doesn't actually have to be on paper? <coughs> no, yeah, it, it, uh, in, um, so yeah, it, it's just anything expressed in print or writing and that's been interpreted to include software as well. And even the act has been amended to kind of to clarify that computer software is, is seen as a literary work. So this yeah. may be a little absurd, but what if you tear up your grocery list and it's Yeah. Yeah. 
I think what you have to, what the argument would be, you'd have to argue that you abandoned your copyright in addition to abandoning the list itself. What the counter argument could be was that you just tore up the list in the same way that if somebody tears up a copy of a book, they're not tearing up their copyright itself. So I guess what I'm getting at is how do you, can you abandon your copyright? I think that yeah. copyright is something, what, what do you have to go through to let it go? No, that's, that's a great question. I mean, just generally in the law, what is seen you know, for abandonment, if you want to abandon property, for instance, you need an intention to abandon and sufficient acts of abandonment. So you need to, when you're walking past a garbage can, deliberately throw something out, as opposed to you know, walking through the forest and just dropping a watch. Um, so in the context of copyright, it, it would be interesting to see what a court would deal with, with that situation. Now one major issue in copyright is the issue of orphan works. The issue of these works that people think, well, you know, this work has been you know, created in the 1960s, I'd like to include a portion of it in this work that I'm in this new work that I'm creating. Uh, I, I've tr tried really hard to find who owns this copyright. To, to, you know, maybe the company's no longer in existence. How do I actually use the work? And that's certainly an ongoing issue in, in you know, around the world, really one that hasn't been accurately decided. You know, it, when we'll look at sort of the period of copyright in just a minute. But if it's, I don't want to give away how long it is, but it's quite quite substantial. So. You know, how can you be sure that a work that you're using is not protected by copyright? Um, and how can you be sure that you're not opening yourself up to a potential lawsuit? Because I think the internet has really made that very, very important because people can just come in on a website yeah. without it it's going to exist for yeah. a very long time. And if someone else finds it years later, yeah. it's still your problem. Uh, if you, if you I mean, yes, it is. I mean, what you can, you can purposefully abandon copyright in a certain way, at least to a certain extent. And this was something I was going to talk about a little bit later, but it's, um, has anyone heard of, of creative, the organization Creative Commons? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so Creative Commons is an organization that essentially allows you to abandon some or all of your copyright should you, should you choose to. And if we see copyright generally as an all rights reserve system, Creative Commons is consistently described as a some rights reserve system. So you can decide that you, know, you might want to allow anyone who wants to to reproduce your work um, for non-commercial ways without, you know, without having to ask you first. You can go to Creative Commons, uh, and there are websites in Canada and around the world. You can tag a license onto your work, and then people will be able to, uh, to essentially use your work without your permission and not have to pay. Uh, you can even, there are various licenses that you can create that, where you can you know, abandon almost all of your rights, and then I think arguably all of your rights should you, should you choose. Um, but Creative Commons is the best tool to use if you think that you shouldn't, you, or you, want, you don't want to have copyright in everything that you create, and if you'd like to open that up and allow people to use it in a more free way. So it's a, it's a, it's a choice, it's someone that you can um, easily access on, online and easily tag to whatever works you're creating. So it is a tool to, but I recommend at least looking, looking at to see if it could help, um, help you as, um, you know, as, as individuals who are involved in the creative fields or just individuals who are creating works or just someone who wants to, to, uh, to take photographs, put them online and let people use them without having to worry about copyright infringement. Yep. What about the trademark slogans? Like, I've always the Nike slogan, just do it. Everybody knows Nike owns that. Yeah. Is that something that people should be aware of? Like, oh, that's the slogan of the Right, so, yeah. Sure, yeah. Well, it, there, there is a minimum length in terms of, you know, how... Uh, to get copyright, your work has to be of a sufficient length. One case that went before the courts, Exxon, wanted to have copyright in the word Exxon. And the courts rejected that as being, that's too small, it's not the proper subject for, for copyright protection. One of the reasons that was rejected was because, well, trademark law is an option. You could trademark that phrase and then have the exclusive right to use that phrase in relation to certain goods or services. So if someone else tries to use Exxon, if another company, if Chevron tries to use Exxon in the context of an oil advertisement, for instance, in certain contexts that could be seen to be trademark infringement. Now Canada Games, and this is also getting into the Olympics, um, there are a, there's a different set of laws that have been put in place to protect uh, the interests of sponsors uh, around large sporting events that are you know, quite restrictive in terms of what someone can do. So uh, in those laws, and those are referred to as ambush marketing laws, um, you're not allowed to, and this is just paraphrasing, um, but you're not allowed to essentially create, an, you know, create the perception of an association with, with, the, you know, with, with the games if you're not an actual sponsor. 
So that, that wouldn't have likely been an issue around the, Canada, around the Canada Games. Certainly was a major issue around the Olympics excel, uh, itself. Um, but that's more in the realm of trademark law as opposed to, as opposed to copyright law. Okay. Um, a couple of other basics that I want to talk about so far. <coughs> Again, you don't have to register your work. You can choose to if you want. Now in terms of, I think I've sort of uh, held back this long enough, but in terms of how long copyright lasts for. Now, can anyone guess what the original term of copyright was from the Statute of Anne? Yeah, okay, so we got originally 14 years, and if you wanted, you could renew it for an additional 14 years. So 28 years in total. Anyone want to guess what the period of crop protection is today in Canada? Pardon? Life plus 50. So the life of the author plus 50 years. Um, likely there will be pressure on Canada to increase its, its term of copyright protection because other jurisdictions like the U.S. and the EU, their term of protection is life plus 70. So it's, it's, a, it's a more substantial term of copyright protection. What if the author is assigned the right to the corporation? Then it goes from the life of the author still um, uh, plus, plus those 50 years. So it goes from essentially when the author was, when the author was born. So you'll see actually, on, I think January 1st every year is referred to as Public Domain Day by the, uh, the Center for the Public Domain in Duke. Uh, and there's a list of all the different works that are now in the public domain. That's in the context of the US, so Canada's would be a, a slightly different. You know, we would be you know, uh, sort of 20 years earlier, but it's sort of the idea that at a certain period of time, you know, those works will be, uh, will be released and available to all without having to seek permission first. Yeah. It, it depends. It depends on what, on how the legislation is crafted and how the courts approach legislation. So that, that'll certainly be, if Canada does decide to increase its term of copyright protection, it should be whether you can pull those works back from the public domain and give them an additional 20 years of copyright protection. I think there are some, uh, there are some serious issues involved in, in actually going down that path uh, in terms of freedom of expression issues and potentially also companies who might run their business model on taking works from the public domain and giving them new life and, and you know, putting them into new context. But that'll be a, an issue that we'll likely have to confront in the next, in the next few years. What yeah? About, what about multiple authors? <clears throat> yeah, if it's a work of joint authorship, then it's usually the, work, the, uh, the youngest author. So, the, uh, so that it would be you know, three authors, the youngest one, when that person passes away, you count 50 years plus the end of the calendar year, and that's the term of protection at that point. Pardon? Yeah, I mean, that, that seems funny. So that someone could lose, if two people authored something and one dies and then the other one outlives them yeah. by 50 years, yeah. then you could have a living author or something that would be copyrighted. Well, no, it, so it would be if you have, so the lives of the authors plus 50 years. So you, you, look, you count both authors. So if one author dies, the second author lives another 50 years and then dies, at that point you count your 50 years. Yeah, and that'd be the end of that point. So there's a distinct advantage to working with younger people as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Was the term that you used work and works? Uh, I th I'm not quite understanding the question. You, a little while back you mentioned a phrase, work and works. I think I might have just... I think I might have just had a, a thick tongue when I, I think I probably meant to say works both times. Works and works? Well, the, the period of copper protection in works is life plus 50. So I think I might have just misspoken if, if I said worth. Did you mention work and um, stuff? Only in the larger sense of the economic value of a, of a copyright. Yeah. Um, yeah. That Yes, it is. Yeah, it's an asset that you can pass on in a will. You can, you can. Uh, if you don't, but if you don't assign it in a will, <coughs> does it, I mean, if, if a piece of the state just passes on, yes, it, it would be part of the state. Right. Exactly. So it'll go to the person to whom it's specifically assigned, the residual legatee, or it would be passed through the intestate succession act. Yeah. Um, well, we're moving quicker than I thought we might, uh, or sorry, I, I'm not quite where I thought we would be at this point. Um, in terms of what people are interested in, I want to make sure that we're talking about, talking about that area. Um, should we talk about defense as a copyright infringement? Uh, what would people like to focus on for the next little while? Any questions or, or just broad areas of interest that you want to see focused? Yep. <laughs> 
Sure. Yeah. Um, show that you're going to watch later on. Yeah. By acts of videotaping it, you are breaking copyright. Okay. Is, you know, is, is there some moral obligation there that you're not actually planning to show it later, you're just planning to use it for personal? Okay, great. So let's talk then about just generally defenses to copyright infringement and specifically the idea, you know, do you have the right to copy something for personal use? Um, so there are quite a few defenses to copyright infringement. Some are very narrow. So if you choose to read or recite in public a reasonable extract from a published work, you're in luck. The Copyright Act will protect you. Um, some defenses are directed towards specific types of works like computer programs. Some towards intermediaries, computers, libraries, archives, and museums. But there's one defense in the Act that's particularly flexible, and it's the fair dealing defense. Uh, so the fair dealing defense allows you to use a substantial amount of copyright protected expression without the permission of the copyright owner and without infringing copyright as long as your dealing was done for a, a certain purpose, as long as it was fair, and as long as you know, certain attribution requirements were satisfied. So essentially it's a three-step process. First, your dealing has to be done for a one of five recognized purposes. For criticism, review, News reporting, research, or private study. Could you say those? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Criticism, review, news reporting, research, and private study. Second, that what you're doing has to be fair. And in terms of whether it's fair, the court will look at a variety of factors, including you know, how much you took, what was the purpose of what you did, um, you know, what was the effect on the market, What's the nature of the work itself? So it'll take a look at a variety of factors to look at essentially, was it fair in terms of what you did? And then for certain types of purposes, if it's for criticism, review, or news reporting, you have to acknowledge the name of the author and a source. You don't have to for the purpose of research or private study, but for the other three, you do. So if the fair, deal if the fair dealing defense applies, then what you're doing isn't infringing. It's not an infringing act. Now, fair dealing has been referred to as a user's right by the Supreme Court of Canada. And it's said to be, you need to give it a large and liberal interpretation. In terms of what a user right means, we're still not sure yet. But I think one thing we can argue is that if you have the rights of copyright owners versus a limitation or an exception, then the rights of the copyright owners would, could be seen as, as um, you know, having greater sway over that limitation. But if you have a collision between a right and a right, then the court will be forced to undergo maybe a more subtle discussion of where should we actually establish the balance between these two things. Now, another defense that exists in the Act is the private copying regime. And this defense is, is much more limited than I think mo most people realize. Um, so it was created in 1997, and it had essentially two goals. The first was to legalize private copying onto what were referred to as audio recording media. And the second is to provide compensation for holders of copyrights for these copies. And how they're compensated is through a levy that exists on, again, certain types of audio recording media. So essentially what was happening around 1997, mixtapes and CDs were leading to rampant copyright infringement but it was impossible to actually enforce this infringement. So the system was developed to allow people to create these types of, of um, you know, compilations or content without infringing copyrights and to make sure that creators receive something as well. This levy is paid by manufacturers and then likely is passed on ultimately to consumers. So basically you pay an extra quarter on any audio cassette tape you buy or an extra 30 cents on CDR and CDRW. <coughs> now, one of the issues with this legislation is that it really does only apply to limited sorts of audio recording media. Maybe, can anyone raise your hand if you've bought any, um, you know, cassette tapes in the last three weeks? No. So, so cassette tapes, you know, maybe less, not necessarily as applicable today. CD, you know, CDs certainly are still applicable, but people are purchasing fewer and fewer CDs. So one of the questions that exists today 
What about MP3 players? What about cell phones? You know, what about computers? These are all audio recording media, or we can conceive of them broadly as audio recording media. They're something that you use to essentially put content on if the purpose of the, um, the system was to compensate creators for, un for unauthorized copies and to allow people to make copies of works without infringing copyright, it seems like we should just expand this system to include you know, levies on computers, on cell phones, and on uh, you know, MP3 players as well. Now with respect to the current levy, it only applies to, or it only protects essentially music producers. So again, it was cassettes and CDs. Initially, when the levy came into, into, into play, people were just putting music onto CDs. So it's thought that, well, you know, you, you add an extra quarter to a cassette, you add an extra 30 cents to a CD, that'll go into a fund, and it'll later be distributed out to those, to those artists, to those musicians. Can anyone see any issues with respect to, you know, now adding a levy onto iPods or computers or cell phones? Yep. Yeah. Right, so you're, you know, some people are subsidizing then, um, some people are, are, are providing a levy who never intend to do any sort of downloading of, of unauthorized materials. So they're subsidizing it, at, you know, from one perspective, unfairly. Great, yep. Well, if you're already paying for music and buying CDs and stuff, should, why should you have to pay a levy that goes back to artists to support them if you're already buying the music in the first place? Yeah, so let's say you buy the music on iTunes and you want to put the music onto a blank CD. You only pay the levy onto a blank CD, but you've already bought the music. Why should you have to pay again to, to use the content? Any other issues with, yep? Um, so is this like not, or like why would you shoot on your watch movies online if they're like perfect quality, if they're there? Like why would they, like, why wouldn't they stop those if it's not? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think one of the main issues are, you know, the, um, if the copyright owner hasn't authorized the, the, the dissemination of that content online, if they haven't authorized that streaming video to go through, then they likely aren't receiving a cut of any profits that are made through advertising revenue or through other sources. So the argument is that, well, if they're not receiving that revenue, it's, it'll be harder for them to actually um, to, you know, to distribute that type of content in the future. So they, sh so that, so it should be not allowed because they're not the ones who are authorizing that that action. Well, another issue too with with um, with computers is if you compare the storage capacity of a computer to the storage capacity of a cassette tape, and if you're paying a quarter on a cassette tape, how much will you have to pay on a computer? You know, and will people actually want to pay an extra $150, $200 onto a computer in order to, to have this levy that goes towards artists? MP3 player is the same concern, cell phones as well. Another issue could be, well, you know, the system worked quite well when you just send it to the Canadian uh, Private Copying Collective, they distribute it to musicians. There have been some criticism of, this, of the system, but in one way you could see, well, it works, some gets to the, to the artists. Another issue could be, well, we're not just downloading music anymore. You know, this, it's movies, there's computer software. You know, how will we you know, create a system where you can actually dis disseminate the, um, the, you know, the, the levy itself after it's calculated to all of those different rights groups? So is it actually workable, workable in practice? So for a whole host of reasons, this, the levy issue has become incredibly controversial. It's been suggested as a way to make sure that people just you know, aren't breaking uh, you know, a copyright law with respect to actions people engage with uh, or in, engage in, in many cases on a daily basis. Um, it's been suggested as a, as a good way to provide compensation to artists, but there are a lot of issues in terms of whether this system can actually be made workable. But this brings into the general question, do you have a right to copy for personal use? So we see, you know, with, with this, you know, private copying regime, it's quite limited. It only applies if you copy to a private recording, to an audio recording medium. As we've seen, those are very narrow. It only applies if you're, if you're copying music. Uh, it only applies, again, in a few certain contexts, so if it's done in a private way. If you then give that copy to someone else, it's not seen as applying in that context. So a very limited right to copy a work. Um, also, fair dealing. If you, make, if you download a work, 
just the act of downloading itself, that's you're reproducing the work, and that's seen as falling within the exclusive rights of the copyright owner. You have to establish a defense. Well, you have to turn to fair dealing. And if what you're doing is for the purpose of research, for the purpose of private study, well, then, then that's okay if you can establish your action was fair. But if it was just to, have a, to, to, to get a copy of a work, it would be difficult to actually argue that that would necessarily fall within private study or would fall within, uh, within research. So there's a limited right to copy for, for personal use, but only if you can fit within these other defense. There's no broad right to copy uh, anything for personal use. Yeah? My understanding is that the law uh, gives some prescription as to what constitutes uh, a percentage of what you can fairly copy and for educational or research <coughs> purposes. But what I heard you saying was that in practice, judges would be faced with assessing the context in which this so I'm just wondering, has much of this come before the courts and has, has there been much case law establishing that uh, whether or not those limits are fair in the law? Yeah. No, that's a great question. And I think, I think I know what you're referring to. Basically, uh, you know, around every photocopy, there's a list of you know, exactly how much you can copy that's fair. Those are more guidelines that are set out in terms of licenses with access copyright. They're not necessarily how the fair dealing defense is interpreted. So you know, in terms of fair dealing, it's this one of, the, one of the wonderful things about the defense, one of the uh, heavily criticized aspects of the defense is it doesn't put in any bright line distinctions. So it doesn't say, well, you can take up to 25% of the work, that's fair, more than 25%, not fair. It just looks at, you know, did you, did you do it for the purpose of research? Let's look at all the factors that were involved, and at the end, let's make a determination of whether that was fair. So in, in one way, it's flexible. That flexibility, though, isn't necessarily always helpful because the only, at the, the only point at which you know it's fair is where a court says it's fair. Yeah. So it, it does create a lot of gray area, which, which um, depending on um, the individual or the institution's um, uh, risk First tolerance. Risk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can, you know, it can mean that your fair dealing defense is actually much, uh, or your, the, what you're using of the fair dealing defense is actually much smaller than what you, what you should have based on the court saying it's a large, we need to take a large and liberal interpretation of it. Yep. Yep. What about um, the e book papers now? Right. Um, you know, you, a lot of people are going on the internet, you don't have to carry paper around. So you buy a copy of an e book for, say, for a reader. Yep. Three years down the road, you drop your e book or whatever, and you buy a new one. Mm -hmm. Or say you haven't dropped that one, dropped one, but you bought a new e book reader. Yep. It depends on the terms of the license. So what I would what I would say initially is, you know, the uh, I think the phrase that I you know I bought an ebook or is is increasingly less accurate in the online context. It's more, you know, um, sort of opening something at Christmas. I'm I'm so excited. I just licensed. I just you know licensed for a set period of time for a certain number of ebook readers this content. So it's it, it's you know replacing ownership of something with with a license, and a license with, with, with set restrictions that, that, uh, that are within the terms of license itself. So if you look at iTunes, it's a good example. With iTunes, you're allowed to transfer, you know, you, you, can, um, you can back up your content because iTunes says that that's okay for you to do that. You can, uh, you know, transfer your content to certain computers that you authorize. You can transfer your content to your iPod. Uh, but beyond those, those elements, you're quite limited in terms of what you can actually do. You're limited by the terms of the license. And essentially what a license is, it's just, permission to do what would otherwise be an infringing act. So uh, what we need to look at now in terms of ebook readers are what do the terms of the license allow you to do? And it's the same thing with um, being able to access content um, uh, through um, different services through university libraries, for instance, in terms of service like Hein Online, for instance, or, or any other service that you subscribe to. What are the terms of the license? Can you print something out? Does it allow you to make certain reproductions? Can you send that to someone? Can you put it in a in a closed environment, and in a lot of instances, what the what Canadian courts and what the Copyright Act says you're allowed to do uh, is um, is less important than what are the terms of the license say you're allowed to do. Yeah. So in the context of, of academics dealing with uh, papers and textbooks, it's yeah. actually legitimately going to be using it for studying or research. Yeah. Um, does it matter what license? 
you, you, can, you can rely on fair dealing if you're you know, using something for academic purposes, if you're uh, taking a copy for research, taking a copy for private study. <coughs> Where the issues, a lot of the issues come in in terms of the academic or educational context are what happens in the context of teaching? You know, what if you want to take an article and use it, distribute it to your class? Um, one of the notable cases that have come across recently, that's come out recently is you can't, uh, or it's not fair to you know, make a copy of a work, make 30 copies and distribute it to an entire class of students. So one of the courts looked at, you know, is that fair? And they came down on the side that it's not, that it's not fair. Um, so it's... So it's not fair to distribute it, but it's fair for them to take it for their own personal study. It's fair, and it's even fair for those individual students to take one copy for the purposes of, for the purposes of research. It's just the idea of making multiple copies and then distributing them wouldn't be seen as fair under the second step of the fair dealing analysis. Yeah. To get it, then they're making copies for personal use. But there's a second infringing act. Remember, we talked about communicating the work to the public by telecommunication. So if you post right. a work to an online environment and then 30 students access it, when those students pull that content down, that's that you'd be seen as engaging a different act, and it'd be a different fair dealing or different fairness analysis than the student pulling one copy down. So there's there are multiple infringing acts in, in that potentially infringing acts in that situation. Yep. I taught for many years. I thought we just had to know the source on the document, you know, on the front of the what you copy, the, the source and the author. And yep. Doesn't that protect the teacher? Um, generally, I would say no. Uh, I think. It says on the, you know, in, in the schools it tells you. Yeah. Right, I think I think actually Jordy is a is a great person to uh, to talk to you about this because you know basically in, in terms of you know what the requirements are for access copyright. So it's, you know in order to make copies, if you if you write down I made thirty copies of this document, here's the here's all the information of it, then then you know compensation will be paid from the school to the collective, which will be then paid to the to the owners. But absence any collective agreement, um, then that that would uh, yeah. Actually, you know, privacy protection and its interrelationship with copyright is, is quite an interesting topic. And it is, it's, in a lot of ways, the reason why we haven't had the same mass lawsuits of users in Canada that we, have, that, that we saw in the US. Um, that Canada's privacy laws, um, uh, you know, companies were able to turn to those privacy laws and essentially we're stuck between, you know, do we pass, on this, pass along this information, do we risk a copyright infringement lawsuit, or do we infringe the privacy rights of our, of our users? So the strong uh, privacy laws that exist in Canada have helped uh, sort of you know, stave off that type of, that type of mass lawsuit. It won't prevent it. Um, the court has set out a list of, of steps that, that, uh, um, uh, that you know, could be taken in order to access those, that information, but it certainly has, has played a role in, in um, the different approach to IP enforcement in Canada as opposed to the US. Sure, yeah. Um, just back to the, the teacher scenario, is if, if you, you have an article, yep. uh, if you're not within access copyright, if you're not dealing with them, you're not allowed to just make copies and pass it over to the whole class physically. Uh, you could send each person, each student to the library and say, go get that journal and make a copy for yourself. You could do that, yes. Based on the way that the law is currently written and interpreted, it seems like, especially this, the, the latest decision from the federal court, that if, if multiple copies are distributed, that that wouldn't be seen as, wouldn't be seen as fair. Um, but the idea that individuals can take a copy of a work for their own, for their own research purposes has been, you know, has been said to be, in, in various decisions, that's something that would fall within you know, the fairness so, criteria. So in the electronic environment, if you put up a link from a licensed source, Yeah, two, two situations there. One, in a lot of cases, that would fall within the terms of the license that you would have with those sorts of electronic resources. But second, that would seem to be consistent with the decision in the past, that if one individual takes a file or makes a copy for their own research purposes, that would be seen as falling within, within, what, uh, you know, within what would be fair. Yeah. One last question. Sure. Um, if you have a work that's in paper form, yeah. Far as 
Well, you know, then you can you can you can count a couple of different potentially infringing acts there. You basically look for you know whatever reproductions are there. If you put something online, then you're let you're potentially communicating it to the public by telecommunication. If someone does pull it down, um, so uh, you know. But again, that would only be the first step of the analysis. The second step would be well. Do you have a defense? And is there, are there, is there a defense that you can rely on? Bill, thank you. Yeah. Are there copyright monitors that? Um, well, potentially. Um, <laughs> cer certain companies have have monitored photocopy rooms in the past um, in the attempt to get in basic information about you know what what uses people are making of materials. So there have been copyright monitors in the past. I don't think that they're Permanent fixture. I think it was more of a, uh, a temporary information gathering, uh, information gathering exercise. That's what they did in the library, right? Pardon? Library library That's what uh, they did, right? They hired students to go find out what was being copied. Oh, I wasn't. I wasn't aware of that. Okay, okay. It's late, I think in a recent case it was um, the content that was looked at, you know, what are elementary schools and what are other schools doing in terms of, in terms of, of, um, of copying works. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about Bill C-32, but as we saw a few days ago, Bill C-32 is, is no longer an issue. Um, one thing I do want to mention briefly, because I think it will come back again, is uh, technological protection measures, which are also known, or can be known as, as digital, digital locks. Um, so essentially, what technological protection measures are, they are um, something like a lock that controls access to a work, or that controls um, what you can do with the work once you have access to it. So you can imagine as one of two of these types of locks. Um, so if, a, if a, a TPM, so a technological protection uh, measure, is used on a book, um, then you know, essentially it would control how you would access it or potentially what you could do with it. The reason why these came about, um, in the mid-90s, there was concerns uh, in the United States of you know, what will happen when content goes online. You can disseminate perfect copies to incredible numbers of people. Each copy will be a perfect copy, different from if you tape from a tape to a tape and then 10 copies later you just get buzz. This will be a perfect copy no matter how many times it gets disseminated. What can we do about it? And one of the answers was, well, let's find a technological solution. Let's put a digital lock on a work. And this lock will prevent people from accessing it who don't have authorization. And this will be a way to, um, to you know, prevent people from disseminating works that, um, that they don't have uh, the authorization to do so. One of the issues with that was these were very, very poor locks. It was very easy to break them. Um, one individual has compared them to if you put a, you know, put a piece of tape on a car door as opposed to an actual lock on the car door itself. So the locks can be bypassed quite quickly, quite easily. So the locks themselves were quite insufficient as this tool to prevent the dissemination of content. So the idea was, okay, well locks aren't enough, let's create a legal layer around these locks. So let's make it an infringing act to break a lock, no matter what you do with the content inside. Initially, the attempt to get those laws passed in the US failed but it was successful in the World Intellectual Property Organization, so international treaty was successful. On the strength of those treaties, it was then, a law was passed in the United States, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which then gave protection for, uh, uh, you know, to these, these digital locks. Since, uh, since this time, since 1998, the attempt has been made in Canada to, to again put, you know, to give legal protection to these types of locks. The attempt was tried in 2005, in 2008, and then again in 2010 with Bill C-32. And the way that the, the, the laws were structured in Bill C-32 was that it is an infringing act to essentially to break a lock that controls access to a book. And it's an infringing act for all except for a very narrow set of purposes. Uh, and those include you know, unlocking cell phones, reverse engineering for software compatibility, law enforcement and natural security ideas or national security activities, and also access for persons with perceptual disabilities. But on what, one thing that was absent from this list of exceptions to you know, where you break a lock um, is fair dealing. 
So it wouldn't be an exception. You can't break, under, under Bill C-32, you wouldn't have been able to, to break a lock that prevents you from accessing a work to then use the work for something that would otherwise fall under your fair dealing defense. So one of the consequences of this could be that you know, creators, students, consumers, and educators could be prevented from exercising their fair dealing rights through the application of a digital lock. Another concerning development was that it was also proposed to make it an infringing act to distribute and, marketing and market devices that could be used to circumvent technological protection measures. And one of the issues with that would be, well, if it's an infringing act to distribute these mechanisms, how can you circumvent them for any purpose, including uh, law enforcement, uh, unlocking cell phones, reverse engineering? So there is potential issues around whether these, um, these laws are necessary, whether they're a good idea, whether they protect business models, and whether there's a sufficient balance built into these laws between users' rights and between, uh, between the rights of copyright owners. So that's actually all I want to say about Bill 32 for now, or for now. Um, Jordy? You're saying, uh, so those were, if you broke the law, yeah. that was an infringement on its own, what, no matter what you did with it. Yeah, exactly. So what about educational purpose, say I'm a computer science student, and I'm breaking the law just for the knowledge of how to break the law, and I don't do anything with the content or anything? Well, that could fall into that could fall into potentially one of the you know one of the one of the exceptions for generally for education purposes it wouldn't um, but you might be able to argue that it could fit under uh, um, you know, one of the one of the narrow exceptions in terms of if you're a computer science student and if you're doing it for the purpose of of um, of, uh, of sort of reverse engineering in that context so that that might be okay but it depends on the specific act and the specific wording of that of that exception. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So in Canada, there's no law right now against so if if there's a digital lock on content, um, you know, there's it's not an infringing act to uh, to circumvent that TPM. Um, now, if after circumventing it, you commit copyright infringement, that certainly is something that um, you know that could be still uh, actionable under our current copyright acts. But those laws haven't been brought into into. Uh, uh, to, the, the act hasn't been amended to include those laws up to this point. Yep? Jeans? Uh, jeans, are they copyrighted? That's an interesting question. Um, it, I think depending on how you conceptualize a gene, you could potentially argue that it would, if you can you know, imagine it as a, uh, as a sequence of, uh, of, of letters, for instance, then you could, you know, could argue that it would be su you know, sufficient link for copyright protection, that it meets the originality standard, um, that, um, that it's a literary work based on our standard of literary work. So it, there could be an argument that, depending on how you conceptualize it, you could have uh, copyright in, the, uh, in, in that uh, conceptualization of a gene. I think it's an argument that's really, that hasn't been made very often. The, the main question with genes are, you know, can you patent genes? Or is it something that is too, um, that, yeah, so that's it's more of a patent issue, but certainly I think it's an interesting issue to think about in the copyright context as well. Yep. Would you first make that distinction? What's the difference between a copyright and a patent? Basically, the distinction is with a copyright you can't patent an idea, or with, sorry, with a copyright you can't protect an idea. With a patent, what you're trying to protect is the idea itself. Um, so, and also in terms of the distinction between the two, much more. Um, the exceptions around what you can do with something that's patented are much more narrow than in terms of what you can do with something that's protected by copyright. So if it's protected by copyright, you can take the idea behind it, you can pull out facts or information, you can use that for multiple purposes, you can take an insubstantial amount, but with the patent, it's, it's, a, it's a much stronger wall of protection. But I think that the most important is likely, you know, patents protect ideas, copyright protects expression. Yep. What's the length of patents? 20 years. So I, oh yeah? I just have a couple of international questions. Sure, yeah. So first, I should be quick. So you're talking about, you know, the residency requirement. So yeah. what, out of the, you know, of, let's say there's 200 countries in the world, how many aren't involved in the software industry? That's a good question. I, I think not many are, are 
not many countries are not involved in these treaties at all. I can't give you an exact number, but it's, it's I think the majority of the world is, uh, is covered by, you know, is a country that's in the WTO or in the Berne Convention itself. So it's interesting actually if you, if you conceptualize a map of the world and if you look at, you know, someone creates a work in one country, immediately protection will spring up in countries around the world. It will be a you know, different type of protection. It will last for different durations. So Canada protection will expire while it still exists in the US, for instance. But in, in most of the countries around the world you know, uh, uh, ha are protected by these copyright laws. Right. And then another question is, um, what about trans making a copy of something, so an electronic copy of something? So say we say we're to a DVD, post it on an American server. Yeah. And then someone downloads that in Canada. Yeah. If you download it in Canada? Right. Yeah. Well, if you download the working. But you are making a reproduction in Canada. So what, what the courts have. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, but more generally, my question is. Yeah. What does. What, what, role, does an, what role does the border play in all of these? Yeah. No, that's a great question. That's one that the Supreme Court of Canada struggled with about seven years ago. Um, but it decided that, you know, as long as there's a real and substantial connection, the court can, the Canadian courts can. Uh, um, uh, here, I claim for copyright infringement. So that could be um, if the server is located in Canada, if the work is posted in Canada, the work is downloaded in Canada. So there, uh, if what you need to look for is, you know, the, the law will want you to look for a real and substantial connection. Yep. Are those protective measures you speak of today? Yes. Uh, that's quite a controversial aspect of those protective measures because, you know, really when a, if, if um, there's, there's nothing that I'm aware of that compels um, in, in distributors who put these types of uh, protective measures on works to remove them after the period of copyright protection. And they can also potentially be used to apply to works to which, you know, there's the works that are in the public domain more generally or works that aren't connected to copyright. So it's, uh, it does pose quite problematic issues in terms of, of, uh, of the scope protection. And if we think that orphan works themselves are problematic, well, what about sort of you know, orphan protective measures if you can't find the key to actually break these, break these locks? Thank you. Yep. Um, what I think I'll, I might close with is just by talking briefly about why I think copyright matters and why we should care about copyright reform. Um, since its inception, so since the 1700s, we've seen copyright expand dramatically in scope, in duration of protection, and as well in a digital world, many actions again involve a reproduction. So a temporary copy, a copy on a hard drive, on a website. So copyright law is increasingly involved in the lives of individuals. But because of the way that copyright laws are currently structured, some of the opportunities that are presented by digital technologies for the advancement of human rights might actually be lost. So digital technologies can create these incredible opportunities to you know, disseminate material for educational purposes around the world, so promote the human right to education. So you can you know, essentially distribute textbooks or papers to you know, all the corners of the world. You can quickly and easily translate material into every language. Uh, you can create a modern day digital library of Alexandria, so promoting the human right to, to uh, you know, preserve a cultural heritage. We've seen you know, many different examples. Google Books is likely the biggest, but we've also got you know, Project Gutenberg, uh, Brewster Kahle's Internet Archive, um, really an incredible number of digital library projects. You know, it allows us to engage in a creative way uh, in works to the extent that just wasn't possible before, and then to disseminate the results of this engagement with a broader community, so enhancing and promoting the human right to freedom of expression. And then you see that with mashups, so where you take um, pieces from two songs, combine them together into one song. Uh, machinima, where you're making you know, your own videos within the context of video games. Or fan fiction, where you write back to your favorite, uh, you know, favorite television programs. Uh, we can you know, assist in enhancing democratic discourse in the search for truth. You know, through you know, being able to post or comment on stories, to add videos, um, to really you know, promote and advance citizen media. But through copyright laws, these, uh, essentially these opportunities can be lost. So lawsuits against peer-to-peer -peer systems can hurt the ability to um, disseminate material for educational purposes. Lawsuits against intermediaries can cause a chill in terms of you know, how, um, 
user-generated content can be uploaded or can be treated. Um, lawsuits against individuals can chill those individuals' desire to actually post comment or uh, post material or reflect on material. So copyright matters, to me at least, because through copyright, some of these opportunities can be lost. So I do believe that we have to revisit, revisit Canada's copyright laws to ensure that a balance should be struck between the rights of users, owners, and other parties. So to ensure that we have a balance between property rights and human rights. So uh, May 2nd, big day coming up, there will be an election. If you're concerned about copyright laws and their impact on human rights, um, you know, ask the candidates in your riding you know, what their positions are on copyright reform and use this information as just part of your decision-making process on you know, what you're going to do on May 2nd. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Really appreciate you coming, and it's great to, to, uh, to see everyone out here. Um, at this point, I'll stop the formal part of my presentation, but I'm certainly happy to take any questions or any more comments.